All right, so welcome everyone to another awesome episode of the Average Ontario Anglers Fishing Podcast. This week is a cool episode because we have an awesome guest. We have Jake Collins, who actually runs the Fish Heads Canada website. He sells all kinds of awesome steelhead stuff, steelhead gear, salmon gear, stuff you need to, to have to get, you know, get those fish in the river. And I thought because trout season opener is coming up really soon, it's coming up in only a few weeks, I thought we could have a local expert to give us some tips. So how are you doing today, Jake? Hey, Jesse, thanks for having me here. Um, yeah, good. Uh, this is definitely something that I've known and done for quite some time here. So I'm glad we can hop on this together and chat about this. Yeah, I'm excited. I've been river fishing my whole life, but Jake's actually an absolute hammer. So I'm I'm looking to learn some tips myself. So if you're someone that does steal a fish, you could definitely learn from Jake. But if you're someone just getting into the sport, you're going to learn a lot today. So before we get into the main topic, I thought we could just do a quick can cast recap. Now, you probably noticed by now, Andrew's not with us today. He's actually busy at work, apparently, or maybe, you know, he fell into a ditch. I'm not sure at this point, but we're just going to keep going anyway. But we're going to do a quick can cast recast. Now, uh, for the last like two months, we've been talking about the can cast fishing show, the biggest fishing show in Canada. We're so excited for it. And as of recording today, that was yesterday. And I'm super tired. Andrew almost lost his voice. We bought tons of stuff. We had a great time. thought we could just cover very briefly some of the stuff that we found exciting and some of the people that we met. Uh, so we got there bright and early, 7 a.m. or 7.30 in the morning. We got in early. Uh, happy enough that uh, Kyle gave us some vendor passes so we could sneak in and see some of the setup, which was awesome. So what we did actually was uh, we got in there. We, we talked to a lot of the guys and, and girls that were setting up. But then we actually had the fun opportunity to go out into the line and hand out some free gifts to people in line. So we had big buckets full of stuff, full of baits, hats, uh, sunglasses, lanyards, all that kind of stuff. So that was that was one of my favorite parts. That was actually awesome seeing some people that we knew too. The show was absolutely insane. There was, I don't even want to guess how many people, but there was thousands and thousands of people there and we met tons of people. So if we did actually see you at the show, it was nice to meet you. And I had a lot of people message me and say, you know what? We were looking for you guys. We couldn't find you. It was a nut house in there. So we got tons of great stuff. We met tons of great people. And it was an absolutely great show. Um, I could go on for hours, but we'll have to do another episode probably next week where Andrew goes in depth on some of the cool baits that he bought as well. So we're going to get back into our main topic. So like we mentioned, Jake is a steelhead hammer. And How long have you been steelhead fishing? Yeah, I'm going to say it's got to be close to 20 years since I went out first river fishing experience with my dad. Yeah. So, and then it's just sort of got exponentially deeper and I've, I'm down so far deep down this rabbit hole of steelhead fishing now, but um, I do it like I love it, right? You do it yeah. for a reason. Tell us a little bit about Fish Heads Canada. So Fish Heads Canada started uh, by Mike Hagen. He's a buddy of mine. He started this back when... He was sort of the first to market with an e-com, you know, buy your bait, buy your products online, where that wasn't so much of a thing. It was 2007 he started that. So um, from there, started as an incredibly small shop. We're still small and niche in the world of steelhead fishing. We definitely don't target to everything like, you know, the, some of the big guys do. Um, but we like to think we have that advantage in dealing, you know, premium bait, um, everything you need if you want to go out and learn how to steelhead fish or salmon fish in the creeks and rivers. Definitely. And I know I, myself, I've ordered stuff from you. I bought a few rods off of you. I have bought a lot of your row over the years. You carry basically anything that I personally would need or, or even dream of needing a lot of nice center pin reels and a whole good selection of rods, anything you need to get out steelhead fishing or even pinning for salmon in the fall, Fish Heads Canada has it. And the shipping is fast. I remember ordering row and I literally had it like two days later it was it was fast it was great maybe that's just because yeah. i live close <laughs> but yeah the the um the, the the row is a big thing of who we are um and and i think how we're recognized uh you know we carry salmon row coho row uh, steelhead rainbow trout row speckled trout row if we can get some brown trout row that comes in that goes out quick um, and, and we 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 work with our suppliers to get the row cured to a level that is still you know a premium product so many people want you know fresh 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 and that's impossible to deal as an e-com company 
mm. or even to even buy it from a bait shop. Um, but we've, you know, we've done this for so long. We've got sort of a recipe down that we work with that has allow us to become who we are in, in the industry and, and recognize for the bait that we have, along with everything else you need to go with that, to, to go have a successful day fishing. Definitely. And we'll talk a little bit more about that row when we get into the, the baits part of this podcast. So I thought this episode could be about trout opener, like I mentioned. Trout opener, it's it's very special for a lot of people when you say, like a lot of people, it's it's that one day when they're just, they're looking forward to that all winter long, all into spring. It's that one day. and I don't know for you, but I know a lot of guys go out and they'll camp out the night before. It's a big event. It's more social, I find. Like, obviously, there's guys that, you know, they catch a lot of fish too those days, but it's a social event, the trout opener. And it's something that's very important to a lot of people. So my question to you, I have a bunch of these questions kind of about mostly opener and maybe a few weeks after opener, the fishing that we can do. But uh, of the overview of how exciting you know, trout opener is like I said, what are some challenges that some anglers are going to have to face when fishing on opener and maybe the next week or two after? Yeah. So definitely that anticipation of trout openers coming is incredible, right? Um, You know, we, we, so, you know, most of us wait all year. We get to this point of the year that there's only one first uh, and only fourth Saturday of April, it's circle yep. on the calendar. I'm going fishing and, and how, ex, you know, how exciting and pumped up we get for that. And whether that's to, you know, if that's your one and only day of the year to go fish, um, for steelhead or whether that's, you know, your chance to get together with a group of fishing guys, you don't get to see, you know, maybe once a year or, or whatever that is. Um, you know, this day's coming up quick and it's, you know, even after 20 years of doing this, I still you know, get a little bit giddy for it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so, you know, with that, the challenges we see with the, you know, the increased fishing pressure and the amount of people that are fishing now um, depends how you look at it is, is a good thing and, and a bad thing. And if you want to take the negative side to that and, you know, with, with that increased number of people, the challenges that come with that are, you know, the, you know, the increased fishing pressure, the, the, how much more challenging it is to find good fishing spots that aren't already taken by an angler. Um, you know, there's, there's quite a few things as well as, you know, what externally, what, what does even the weather look like and weather patterns and river flows. And if that's now doubled down on the pressure, what does that look like? We could, we could talk about this just only for, for an hour, but yeah. Um, <laughs> Definitely, you know, the amount of the amount of anglers that are out there now is a challenge, but there's, you know, that's not, you know, the be all of it. Um, there's, there's, there's workarounds and ways you can go have an incredible day fishing, you know, even with the challenges that, that we see now in, you know, 2024. Definitely. So why don't we cover some of those challenges? So if someone's just getting into steelhead fishing, or maybe you've never fished trout opener before, you mentioned pressure and like, again, we don't want to sound like old men, you know, I'm in my early thirties. I don't know how old Jake is, but he's not, he's not that old, but we remember the days that it wasn't that bad. Now I know some of the older guys will tell you stories of like, Oh, I was the only guy in the river and I caught 60 fish an hour. And those days are gone. But even 20 years ago when we were fishing, it wasn't as bad as it is now. Like there's tons of people that are, that are still fishing now. And it's trout fishing is it's enjoyable. It's exciting. The surroundings are amazing. It, it's no wonder that people want to get into a sport, especially the fact that generally speaking, you don't need a boat. All you need to do is buy a rod and a reel, maybe a pair of waders, a few baits, and you're good. So it's it's super accessible. It's a great way to fish, but tons of people do it. So if if you've never gone to an opener before, you'll see cars lined up down the road at popular spots. You'll go walk along the creek, guy here, guy here, guy here, like five guys here. It's just packed. So if you were dealing with that, if you were getting into steelhead fishing and you didn't know about, you know, like secret spots that some of these guys have, how would you, what would you first do? Like, what kind of research would you do to find a a place to actually go fishing? Yeah, that's a good question. And we're we're all at that point at some point, some point in our journey here. Uh, Definitely the resources we have now with, you know, Google Maps. Um, I would, I would definitely suggest starting with, I guess, first thing you have to do is open up your mind 
to understanding the trout opener now means I don't, that doesn't mean I have to go park in the most popular parking lot to go fish the most popular spot that's, you know, only open on it on the fourth Saturday in April. What it means is you can go now fish, you know, as long as you're doing it properly within, you know, the definition of, of the season in your zone. But for most of us here, you know, especially Great Lakes Zone 17, that means you can go fish anywhere in within the zone for steelhead. And so I think the biggest thing I would suggest starting with is, you know, forget about what people talk about as the most popular spots to go and open up your mind to understanding more so the patterns of fish that every fish you see of steelhead in the river have to get to those popular spots. They likely go past those popular spots to spawn. And then they likely are now dropping back on, on the second chance to catch them the whole way through the system back to the lake. Mm -hmm. So as long as you're going somewhere and fishing public land that you're, you're allowed to be at, or you have permission from a private landowner, which you would have to go obtain yourself, which I, I, I wouldn't suggest start with just fishing public water, understanding where fish are in river systems and, and why they're there and the right presentations to be using at the right time. I would strongly suggest following that path, fishing the very, you know, most popular places and going and finding areas where you can do your own thing. And the, the chances are there's going to be fish there. Yeah. I've had some of my best days. Uh, I, I'm not even going to lie. The last few years on opener, oftentimes we won't even fish the normal opener spots. We'll fish downstream and no one's down there. That <laughs> As soon as it's opener, everyone's like, oh, I can fish up north now. And everyone goes up north. You can go to the, some of the lower sections of the creeks, which, like you said, the fish are dropping back. There's still going to be fish there. They may not be as concentrated, but there's still a lot of fish there. And you could fish and only bump into one or two guys. So definitely, like you said, learn where these fish are going to be in the river. And you don't have to be fishing the most popular spots because sometimes you go and on some of the rivers, it's an absolute joke, the amount of people you can see fishing in a small area. And some people don't mind that. There's, there's people that don't mind. It's a social thing. They don't mind, you know, fishing shoulder to shoulder. But for me personally, I, I hate that. I hate fishing with like 50 people in one spot. So I'm the kind of guy I'd rather cover. I'd rather cover water, go for a walk. Basically, it's, it's more like hiking and possibly fishing some spots that I, that I walk across. I'm going to cover water and just find, you know, a little pocket here, a little pocket there, not focus on these big pools that everyone kind of congregate on. So that'd be my tip too. And you kind of got into the, another challenge you mentioned was like, you know, the water and the weather. Cause like, I know sometimes on opener, it's like, you know, we got flooded out. It, you know, it just poured rain the day before. And there's all kinds of things, like you said, like the weather could be absolute trash that day or the water could be gin clear and super low. So what kind of research would you kind of do if you're planning to go fishing on opener or that week around weather? Like what are some total days that, you know, it's just going to be a bad idea. <laughs> Yeah, so the most, you know, there's so many resources that we can use now, and it's really understanding how they all work together. But by far, the best resource you can go use is the hydrometric data that comes out by the government of Canada. And you can, you can Google it, and, you, you, you know, these are referred to as the flows or the charts between right. anglers. And what that does is it gives you real-time data or, or very close to real-time data of the water levels in that area. And I'm not sure if Arthur touched on this earlier in his podcast, uh, which you guys did an incredible job on. Um, but when you're following, you know, if you're following these charts, you start to understand, you know, which, which metrics, what flows and what, what rates and heights are, are sort of ideal, what sort of too high and what sort of too low. And so that takes a bit of understanding yourself, putting some time in to see, you know, if you, so my suggestion is, if you go check out a river anytime when you're there, when you come home, check the flow and make it, make a note of it. And now you know what that flow looks like and what in real time that looks like at the river. So, you know, I can't, I can't just easily give an example of what a number will be for a specific river that takes, you know, some data on your end to go do some research and find, but having that resource that, you might be getting a ton of rain in your own backyard, but where you might want to go fish an hour from now, whether that's 
you know, west, east, or, or north, they might have got a sprinkle, no rain, or even more rain. And so it, it comes, you know, in handy big time for that. You know, as well as understanding wind and, you know, overcast, sunny, you know, just generally what our weather looks like for the day. All these things together combined, um, as, you know, again, Arthur said earlier on the previous podcast, all these things together can, can make an amazing day or, you know, you might, you know, you maybe should have stayed home. But yeah. you need to go out and experience that and know what those days are and what they look like to then learn from that to move forward. Definitely. Like you said, time on the water is, is huge because you're not going to be able to just like, oh, I've never steeled fish before. I'm just literally going to, you know, go down to the creek and know exactly what the flow chart is. Like you have to literally know. I, I've gone down to the creek, like I've been fishing, you know, creeks my whole life. And some days, especially when, you know, you're just starting out, you might try to fish days that might be a complete waste of time. <laughs> Like it poured rain for three days and you go down to the creek, it's three feet higher than normal and there's trees flowing down. Like that's a bad day. So it's sometimes it's pretty common sense when you can realize these things, but learning the flow charts is huge. And you know, almost every experienced steelhead guy that I talk to, they always bring that up. So that is something that's very important because steelhead fishing, it's all about the flow. <laughs> it's all about the flow, right? And the rain. So getting more into fishing opener and we're not just talking that specific day but like at this after opener the first like week or two and guys are still targeting steelhead after that i find a lot of guys that aren't diehard steelhead guys they kind of graduate to other fish they're gonna be like okay walleye season just opened and they don't hit the river again after that i know some hardcore steelhead guys they're gonna still go out you know well into may for sure but if you are fishing this pressured water we're gonna get some tips from jake about catching pressured fish because again you're fishing opener these fish are generally they're hammered like <laughs> they see tons of stuff they see tons of people so what are some tips for you if someone was out fishing to help them catch these pressured finicky fish yeah so it it does get to that point you know once we get through the madness of sort of the first morning where you know more than more than likely the majority of the fish you're seeing are have gone through their spawning process. They're now dropping back. They're extremely hungry. And you have this, you know, window of fish that haven't been touched in months that are hungry and, and that sort of madness of the opening morning. But as you said, yeah, once we get past that, um, if you are somebody who wants to go out, uh, I would say, you know, just be mindful, first of all, that you're, you're ethically fishing water that's you know, cool enough still for the fish. I know these fish, some of them get trapped and hang around, you know, they can, they can get trapped and hang around all summer. So, yeah. um, but, but more so here, just talking sort of like that first week or so, you know, when it's definitely still cold enough out, um, when you're, you're fishing, if you're stuck fishing pressured fish, you can start with a few tips. And if you're adapting and the fish still aren't going, then it's time to move on and try to find more fish, right? Constant moving. Um, not being, you know, camping with, you dropped your hip pack, you dropped your, your your chest pack, whatever it is, your water, and, you know, you're fishing that one hole for hours. You know, my advice is move on. You, you, you anywhere in the system now, you know, start walking. If you can't, then yeah, you know, or, or it starts to turn on, but definitely my biggest piece of advice would be is simply downsizing whatever you're presenting. If you're throwing something, they aren't they aren't going for it for what you're presenting. You have a few options. You either change what you're presenting, which would be changing your style from fishing spawn bags um, or beads or plastics or flies. So you rotate through that, and then you start to downsize your size. And then there's also the colors, the color aspect of it. So generally when you're fishing in, you know, in this situation where um, they're pressured and spooked, you know, generally if a fish is pressured and spooked, it's because they are in a condition that puts them vulnerable, which typically is lower and clearer water, or that they've simply seen so many external um, uh, variables, which are anglers out there angling. And, you know, they sort of, 
you know, get weary and, and, and get spooked, but you can be in those situations and still catch fish, but it typically means, you know, downsizing your row bag, going to a more natural size presentation or changing into something like a smaller fly, smaller stone fly. You know, if you want to get into the world of, you know, dropping right down to a size 18, size 20, size 22 fly. I know they're tiny, but that might be what it takes to get these fish to want to eat. Definitely. Yeah. And I like what you said is rotate through the, through the presentations. Cause most steelheaders, they, they have all those things, you know, beads are going to be like a main staple for steelhead guys. And everyone generally has row bags, pink worms, you know, all the usual stuff. And you may think, you know, you got a pool with maybe five or six rainbows sitting there. How many row bags have they seen in the last 24 hours or, or three days? You know, possibly say one angler sitting there for half an hour and drifted in front of the thing 500 times. And then another guy walks up after he leaves. He drifts 500 times a row bag. And the next guy comes up. He drifts a pink worm. They see things constantly. They're not smart fish, but they're not dumb. <laughs> you know, if maybe they got hooked before and they, they see that and they're just turned off by it. And it's happened to me several times where you're fishing, you know, row bag, which is a fantastic presentation and you're just not catching anything. And then you switch to a fly and then first drift, boom, your bobber flips under just that one thing they wanted. They, they're not interested in the one thing, but then it could be totally opposite an hour later. So you just have to keep switching through it. And like you said, color can make a difference too. these fish. They can be very finicky. Like we always think, you know, like bass fishing, we're always like, oh, bass are so dumb. They'll hit anything. But sometimes with steelhead they won't hit something if it's literally a different shade of pink <laughs> it's it's so weird like i don't understand how fish see because i'm not a fish but whatever they're seeing they're not liking it and you switch something really small and then they crush it so definitely that's a, that's a great tip jake yeah and the other thing like you said is going down in size i've had days too where i'm drifting an eight millimeter bead no problem and the water is just clear you drop down to a six and you you smash fish but you go up to the eight, you won't catch them. And it, the difference in size of the bead, it's so, it's not even that much, but just that little thing makes a huge difference. So those are great tips for sure. Yeah, I would I'll just jump in on that and, and say that one thing that you, you don't generally see in the space is small, small, small row bags. You mm. can tie row bags, you know, the size of a six, you know, think of it as a six mil bead which might only be two or three little um, rainbow trout eggs. But, you know, if you're, you got to open up your mind to, if I can present a single six millimeter bead and it, and the fish wants to eat that, I'm now presenting something the same size, but now you're miles ahead because you've got the smell of natural fish rope with that mm, as well. That's a great. So, <laughs> right. So I keep that one tight to the chest sometimes, but um you, you rarely ever see somebody fishing something so small like that. Um, you know, and then, you know, beads, there's, there's, you know, there's now hundreds and thousands of colors you can get where we're not quite that far yet with spawn tying material, but you know, you don't also, you also don't need, need all of that, right. You stick to your natural colors, peach, blue, white, and, you know, don't, don't sleep on the really small, uh, row bag sizes. Definitely. I've actually, I used to tie my own flies. I actually used to fly fish a lot. I used to tie my own flies. And some, I had a day maybe two years ago, and I was fishing one of the creeks out of Lake Ontario, gin clear, maybe a few days after opener. And I found this pocket of fish. And there was literally like 20 of them just randomly behind this little pocket just sitting there. And I couldn't get them to hit anything. And I, I pulled out of my bag. I have a little fly box. And I had these like number 16 or 18 prince nymphs that I used to tie. Literally smaller than your your pinky nail, just tiny little things. And I tied one on, and I was like, "You can't even see the thing; it's so small." He cast it out, and I smoked like three or four of them in half an hour. These fish, they just that little tiny bait that you basically can't even get your line in when you're tying it on the hook. <laughs> these fish, they hit it. It's just the tiniest little baits. Don't worry, they're big fish. They like to eat big things, but they also like to eat tiny things. Do you have any theories on why a big rainbow trout? will hit a tiny little nymph. I think they're they're smart. The you know like any fish the older they are the more things they've seen. Uh, and if if they're in a situation 
they put themselves in this situation to get that big. And that's not just out of pure luck. Like they, they do get smarter with time. I believe that, you know, big things just might look more unnatural to them. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I think if sometimes they're just not like us, like if I've just sat down and had like a killer ribeye dinner and somebody puts another ribeye in front of me, you know, maybe I'm not hungry enough to just sit, you know, it's as simple as that. Yeah. Just a little snack, something that they haven't seen. Definitely. So I thought we could talk a little bit about stealth and patience, two things that I personally think that every steelhead or trout angler should have. So why don't we talk about stealth? One mistake I see a lot of people steelhead fishing is they have literally no, <laughs> they have no stealth. They're walking down the creek, clomping down the bank, you know, or they're wading through spots that they shouldn't wade through. I see a lot of people that wade and fish in the creek when they could be standing on the bank. Like, why are you in the water? You're scaring the fish. So do you have any tips for being stealthy? And why is that so important? Like we know steelhead are very finicky and spooky. So why is stealth so important? Yeah, it's simply if the the fish know, if the fish know you're there, you know, they have their, you know, I'm so far from a biologist, but their, their ability to sense that you're there and there's danger. And then, you know, I'm not going to eat, right. I'm not going to, I'm not going to bite down on whatever you're presenting. So yeah, I think, you know, just like hunting or fishing, um, especially with steelheading, it is incredibly important. And, you know, things you can do is try to dress sort of as camouflaged as you can with um, the environment. And, you know, just be be cautious and wary of what you're doing with your footwork. If you don't need, I never am in the water unless I have to be. Um, that simply being in the water is, is going to spook fish versus not. But then you see ducks come flying in. It's like, you know, there's so much natural stuff that happens that, you know, you sort of mimic at the same time. But yeah, I think it's a best practice. The, the least amount of time you can spend on the water, in especially in a spot you're fishing, will help you. And, you know, this is another thing that I learned when I, you know, way back when I started and, you know, I was doing some reading, you know, reading. Now everyone, everything's online. And uh, <laughs> yeah. this is actually reading a, a, a hard copy book. But um there's something with the angle of, of, of the fish, the fish eyes lens that when you see some people make the mistake of crouching down because they think they're making themselves more stealthy. Yeah. The fish actually pick that up more. Interesting. And the best thing you can almost do is stand tall like a tree versus crouch down. The taller you are, as I remember it, at least the, the less identifiable you are as if you were crouched down. And, 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 you know, yeah, I, I, you know, I've never really crouched down, so I can't say that I actually have data to support that, but <laughs> I don't, I don't worry about crouching down to hide myself anyway. Yeah. So I know a lot of people, they will think that fish cannot see above the water, which is completely false. They can see at certain angles above the water, which is important. Like you said, to I'm not saying you have to dress in full camouflage when you're trout fishing, but you don't want to be one of those guys that's wearing a full, you know, deer hunting jacket down at the creek, a bright orange jacket. Like, I'm not saying you won't catch fish, but your possibility of catching more fish is probably not the best wearing that. A lot of people too, like you said, yeah, they'll wade through and, and stand in the pool they're fishing. It's like, if you don't have to stand in the water, not only is it not the best for the, you know, ecology of the creek, just, you know, running through the water all the time, but you want to be as stealthy as possible. And in my opinion, that means not being in the water. And also, like you said, if you have to stand so the fish can't see you, don't be waving your arms around or, you know, try to be still, try to be stealthy. You're stocking up on these fish, especially after opener. They're very like gun shy, you know, like a lot of stuff has happened to them in the last few weeks and they've seen a lot of anglers. So the more stealthy you can be, the more fish you're going to catch, in my opinion, because how many times have you walked down the bank and you don't see a fish, and you step down hard and all of a sudden you see like two or three fish shoot up the creek that you didn't see. Like, they can feel your yeah. steps. They can feel it, right? So they, they see you before you see them, you know, in, especially in that, you know, lower, clear water. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. They're very aware of their environment. hundred percent. Most fish are. So what about patience? Why, when it comes to steelhead fishing in general or trout fishing, why is patience really important for an angler to have? Yeah. Patience and persistence for sure. Those two go together. And I can't tell you how many times over over the amount of times I've been fishing, I have, um, you know, you go, there, there can't be fish here. I've fished this for an hour and I've thrown different things 
and nothing's happening. And then all of a sudden and your flow goes down. Um, it's definitely, you know, they say muskie is a fish of, of a thousand casts. Steelhead sometimes are, you know, the fish is hundreds of drifts. So, um, you know, don't give up. Don't be discouraged. I think I went something like, 17 outings on my own after my first trout open with my dad that I didn't catch a fish and it takes time they're hard to learn but I also say to everybody enjoy that journey because once you do get there and you do learn you know you can always continue learning and growing but that opportunity of your first window of learning that patience and persistence and when you get through that and you do catch those fish that's incredible and invaluable. And it's so satisfying. I remember that too, because my dad was a trout angler, but he wasn't a steelhead guy. He caught a few over the years by accident, kind of, but he he never actually targeted, like he never float fished. So I kind of taught myself that because I was before like the internet. So <laughs> they, again, we were reading, you know, Ontario to Doors magazines and Field and Stream and the fishing books. We didn't have like YouTube videos. So I had to figure it out myself. And once eventually lots of trial and error, lots of you know patience going out lots of times getting skunked I, I can't tell you how many days i went out and caught absolutely nothing but once you get that dialed in and you can actually consistently go out and catch fish it's so satisfying it's like it's a lot of hard work but you can you can definitely do it and there's so many resources like you said now learning to to cast a center pin reel back in the day was a nightmare <laughs> and now you can watch 20 videos on how to do it and they're all explained perfectly good and again it still takes hard work to do it but there's so many resources it's fantastic so I thought we could just go talk a little bit about baits because I want to talk about your row, why it's so special. So you yourself, when you're going out steel fishing, say you're packing your, you know, your, your vest or your sling for, for trout opener, what are you personally going to bring? And you don't have to tell us any of your secret baits, but what should an angler have just to be prepared for any situation that they could come across? Yeah, definitely. I think trout opener is the only and this is wrong, so I probably even sh gonna, shouldn't say it, but I will. It's probably the only time of the year that I sort of throw everything I can into my pack. And you should, I think by best practice, you should always sort of have everything with you. So if something's not working and the next thing's not working, you've got that next option to throw at them that you don't think you would normally use. Mm -hmm. I definitely will go with, you know, I'll bring depending on what the conditions show and this is again the, the using your resources of what the flow flow chart says what scouting in advance will show me um that will sort of tell me what colors and sizes to bring but if you're if you're not sure you know the, the full full range of beads and you know from six to eight to ten mils um and you know a variety of colors you, you know start with definitely start with always having your natural colors the, the peaches and the oranges um some brighter colors and then you know some some funky colors sometimes um you know having having a, a variety of row with you is an incredible opportunity to put yourself above somebody fishing in a pressured area um i will definitely tie up both rainbow trout row and speckled trout row and what that does is just gives you that option of a different scent if that might be what they're onto that day and so many times that happens um you've got something that other angles around you don't have and that's what the fish want and you can be that person catching the fish um you can never go wrong with having your classic you know worms some you can go to um pick up some real worms you can go to a, you know a convenience store and pick up uh some worms um you know your plastics your pinkies um, any sort of grub imitations and uh, I would definitely suggest throwing some flies in you know and different sizes like we discussed um, so natural stuff most flies do come natural colors that you see that you want to be using for this so you want to be replicating stoneflies caddis um, you know in your olives browns blacks natural colors um, and anywhere you know between you know you can go larger sizes for uh, muddy water and um, right down to you know really small again size 18 size 20 caddis things that might be the ticket um, for for you know what's showing for spook fish definitely so lots of baits 
it's it may sound i think with any type of fishing it may sound kind of intimidating if you're just getting into it but what happens is you slowly accumulate this stuff and it's not like you buy a bunch of packs of beads that the next time you go you're gonna have to buy them generally you're not losing a lot of baits hopefully and you just sort of accumulate colors and like you said like natural but also have some crazy colors too like i've caught fish on the weirdest colors of beads like it's just like pink swirl with white it's like it looks like nothing in the water but for some reason the fish wanted that color that day and like you said i i honestly think flies are one of the most underrated uh, steelhead bait especially for beginners like i know most experienced steelheaders have them and they use them for sure but i feel like when i worked at the tackle store when i used to sell stuff everyone just wanted the same things it was either beads pink worms or robex that's it and i'd be like oh why don't you grab some black like little you know jig flies and they're like oh i don't use those they don't work <laughs> i was like you should try them because they actually they absolutely do work uh I, I don't know what to tell you but i've got a few of my buddies on to using flies but they're absolutely fantastic and sometimes that's all they want especially in clear water i find it's just such a buggy natural presentation right so there's there's also the misconception that flies have to use fly fishing and that's so far from true um, there's no reason you can't tie a fly underneath some shot underneath a float and drift it with a center pin rail and have that fly do the exact same thing that you would um, fly fishing exactly and i know i'm gonna i'm gonna start some wars here but <laughs> drifting a fly underneath the center <laughs> underneath a bobber center pin fishing or bobber i'm gonna get mad but a float may even be more effective than swinging it on a fly rod just saying I yeah. I've, I've done both i i used to be a, a fly guy i used to drift like a 10 foot you know six weight you know i used to do all that stuff i used to indicator nip fish but i tell you center pin fishing in my opinion can be more effective and less of a nightmare especially in those bushy creeks where you don't have a lot of space to cast so again you're probably realizing as we're talking we are talking about float fishing i thought we could just very briefly talk about other techniques so i kind of wanted to talk to you about adaptability so float fishing very popular and it's popular for a reason because it, it, it's very effective the float suspends your bait so that it's not getting snagged on the bottom you can actually get it right in front of the fish's face as it's drifting down which is perfect but there are other ways to catch steelhead in the creeks like you said live bait you mentioned using worms i know that's kind of a little trick a lot of people they won't even think of using live worms they'll be like i use the pink worm but you can buy a box of those little red wigglers those are absolutely dynamite. They're, they're killer sometimes. The fish just absolutely love them. That extra scent and even the wiggle has to be a, a huge thing too. So is using live bait something that you regularly do? Or is that more of like a thing you do when it's absolutely like you have to do it because the fish are just super pressured? Yeah, I I typically don't really ever use live bait. Um just out of how convenient it is with substitutes now yeah. um, with plastics and beads that you really don't need to. Um, but I'm going to say that if you do go out and source some lot, real live bait, that your odds of catching fish are probably going to be higher. Yeah. I, I see a lot of people, especially when the waters, like say you, you have a day and it just pours rain and the water's chocolate milk or very murky. You can do very well, not float fishing, just a regular rod and reel anyone probably owns, a split shot, maybe 12 inches above just a bait holder hook with a dewworm on it. Drift that through a deep hole, guarantee you'll, you'll catch a fish. I've caught tons of steel over the years doing that. And pick up the odd brown too that's, that's living in that hole anyway. So don't, don't think that you need all this fancy gear to go out and catch a steelhead. You can just go down to a, a nice hole in the headwaters and drift a dewworm and still catch some fish. No, some other. There was. Go ahead. There was a convenience store back um, right around the corner of where I was at in, in university, and they sold worms out of pop cans in a vending machine outside the convenience store. You put in your, you know, whatever it was, two bucks, and yeah. out comes this aluminum tin, looks like a pop can, and it's got a little end on it, and it's got you know some dirt and worms in it. It was, you know, um, so so it's definitely available that you can go out and get get live bait if. if if you're looking for it that that's hilarious man i need a pop machine full of worms i remember they used to have remember barclays back in the day they used to have a, a vending machine that yeah you'd put money in and a box of worms would come out i remember stopping there right. one time with my dad yeah so definitely worms 
it's always an option again like in all types of fishing i prefer not to use live bait especially if i'm going to do catch and release because i don't want to sound like a weirdo but like it just seems weird killing something to catch something to throw it back if i'm going to keep the fish it's like i'll sacrifice a worm you know good karma for me you know but i'd rather not use live bait if i don't have to but hey if that's what you like doing do it worms are popular for a reason they they sound cliche but they work another thing i don't know if you do this but fishing spinners and spoons do you ever do that yeah i not really uh, you have like it's incredibly effective for sure especially in water that's large enough that respects that style of fishing so that's more you know your estuaries down down by the lake um and fishing larger systems of water um you know you can't you can't just go fish some of these headwater areas with spinners there's, there's such a small usually such a small opportunity to do that. Yeah. Um, but if you're fishing areas that warrant it, then absolutely. I know guys that go out and do that and can be incredibly successful with it. Yeah, definitely. And if you have a lot of space, some of these headwaters, they're just full of snags anyway. So you hook a fish, you're probably going to lose it if, if you know you have a spinner on and it just goes under a log. So some of the wider areas, one thing that me and Andrew love doing is we'll go down there with just like Panther Martins or Meps. And we'll just cast them kind of, swing them in through a pool and some of these drop backs that are just hanging out they're they're hungry they're looking for food they they absolutely smash those things and just scream downstream it's absolutely fun but again like you said you don't want to be doing that way up in the headwaters because it can be a nightmare <laughs> an absolute nightmare so it's it's good it, there's good opportunity to fish the whole length of the creek once opener happens and there's different techniques you can use you can float fl fish you can fly fish if you want if you have the room you can use live bait which is easy or you could use you know hardware spinner spoons a lot of guys will use little flatfish too or the rebel cricket hopper all those little crankbaits and stuff again there's tons of opportunities so i thought we could talk a little bit about your row because this is a product that i personally have been buying for a few years and i'm not a guy anymore that fishes steelhead hardcore back before i was married i used to get out there you know three four days a week when i could now for me I can't have tons of row going at all times. So I need convenience. So tell me a bit about, about that, the convenience of using your, your row. Yeah, sure. So what we do is we offer the service that you can now purchase row directly from us. Uh, we carry different species. I said before, you have some coho salmon, um, rainbow trout, speckled trout right now. And that allows you to fish with real natural fish row, not an imitation. And you don't have to kill a fish to source that yourself. Now, I know you can go and you can, you know, some guys go and if you're lucky and you find a fish at the right life cycle in their spawn, you can sort of squeeze and 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 source some role like that ethically without killing fish, if that's what you're after. Anyway, what we do is we provide that row for you to go angle with as your presentation and what we do is we work and we work with sourcing row from different farms all across North America. We've tried, oh my God, we've tried so many different farms and working with, working with recipes and getting ourselves to the point here now where I truly believe we have premium products. I, I only fish with our row ourselves, myself. And what that does is again it allows you to pick that from us we ship it direct to you from frozen cured ready to go but cured just enough that you're not sort of getting these fake bouncy balls that if you over cure with some of the stuff off the shelf you can go buy without naming anything um you know we we this is tried tested and true and again offering different species so you're presenting you know different scents um, and that, again, as I said earlier, can be the ticket for, you know, having an incredibly successful day out on the water. Um, so what we do is that gets shipped to you, vac sealed, frozen. Um, and you now, that now it's yours. Some some people add more cure or color or, you know, other nibs to, to it. But our, our goal is is to have it to you that you can you can now tie it up in whatever size you want, whatever color you want, it's now yours to make your bait your presenter, uh, but to give you that, that, that product to do so. So we offer it in one third pound bags, which sort of gets you between 50 and 100 um, bags of spawn bags that you would tie up yourself, depending on your size. 
Um, and we also offer one pound bags now, which is new in the last year because we had we had people that would then you know split it, share it with their fishing buddies, um, even you know save that discount by buying more volume at once and then back selling it and freezing it themselves for future use. But yeah, it's what we sell. What we sell to you is ready um, to either tie up right away or you can throw it right in your freezer and it will keep frozen for you know we've had some guides who work with us, work with tell us that you know three four years later they pulled old stuff out of the freezer and it still fishes well for them definitely and i have stuff in my freezer right now and the thing that i like about it is uh again i'm not someone that's fishing like hardcore in the spring for steelhead anymore but i buy the packs i buy the one third pound packs and i can generally buy two of those and i'm good and i'll just unfreeze the amount i'll take the amount that i need for that trip like maybe i'm going out on the weekend and be like okay i need 50 row bags i'll i'll take out that much i'll free i'll tie them up whatever size i want which i like because i can customize it sometimes you know oh the water's high tomorrow i'm going to tie them bigger water's low i'm going to tie them smaller i can customize the way i want i can use the mesh that i want the color that i want so basically i'm getting a premium egg product but everything else i get to do which i like <laughs> i like to customize my my stuff as most you know anglers that are serious about the sport they don't like to buy stuff off the shelf that's already done for them they want to do it exactly they're meticulous as to what they want but the point i was going to say is like i like the fact that i can just tie what i want and then the rest of it i'm going to seal it back up stick it back in the freezer and not have to worry about it i don't have to worry about oh i've got eggs from a fish and now i got to go home and cure it and then i have to tie it up into bags it's all done it's easy it's super convenient and the stuff catches fish it's all i've been using the last probably three or four years honestly i haven't kept a fish in in years like a, a female anyway so it's great stuff and like you said you have tons of different different species of of eggs too right because i hear a lot of guys they'll have a specific they're like oh you gotta have those coho eggs or you know the speckle eggs right and it just that different scent like you said can make a huge difference so there's this this incredible misconception in the world of spawn and row that brown trout row is is by far the best row you need to go you need to go get brown trout row if you want to have a great day fishing and i can honestly tell you i've taken brown trout row speckled trout row rainbow trout row and salmon row all with me doing field testing fished in a pool that i knew there were fish in nothing went on brown trout row i throw a speckled trout row in next drift fish Hmm. So, and I'm not saying that's a very small example of one situation. I'm not saying brown trout row won't go catch you fish. It absolutely will. But don't get caught up. And this goes for any species, actually. Don't get caught up in thinking you need, I can only fish rainbow trout row for steelhead and rainbow trout. Or I can only fish uh, salmon row for when the salmon come in. That is like so far from the truth. What you're doing is presenting bait in front of a fish. And if it wants to feed and eat or attack out of aggression, it's going to. Yeah. Right. So don't don't get caught up in the only fish a brown trout row or or a Chinook salmon row during that time of the year when that species of fish are going. Even as far as some guys will only fish row from that body of water. They will source row from a fish and they will only fish that row in that creek. And that's just you know, I just I just laugh when I hear that kind of stuff. Yeah, it, it's funny how some anglers that the the random confidence things that they have going. I, I honestly like I when I was younger, I used to fish Chinook row for everything, and I still caught fish. You're not gonna have a steelhead that's looking at a it's hungry and it sees a bunch of eggs drifting towards it. It's like, wait a second, those look to be about eight millimeter, not five. Like, no, like, they're gonna hit it. They're not that intelligent. They're not looking at it with a microscope. So. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I I have heard that about brown trout row. I've never used it myself, but now I'm definitely not going to try it. So thanks. <laughs> Thought we could talk a little bit about um, conservation because I know you're really into conservation, especially uh, you know your row is great, and the cool thing about it is you don't have to kill a fish to get your eggs. And I know a lot of guys are like, you know what, I'm going to keep a few fish a year. That's totally your right. Nothing wrong with that. I have nothing against that at all. Problem is. I like to have, I like to think that, you know, anglers that are serious about the sport would like to, you know, keep the sport going, have the fish spawn and not kill them just to get some bait. And I know a lot of guys would be like, oh, I'll eat the fish, but 
oftentimes I feel like they're just keeping it for the eggs and then they eating it as the second part. They're like, I'll eat it, of course. But the fact is you can buy eggs that are from a farmed fish that's already going to be eaten, that was grown in a farm and not, you know, killing a native fish that hasn't spawned yet. You know, food for thought. But conservation, what would you say is the importance of ethical fishing practices uh, and respecting the catch limits with steelhead fishing? Because I know they changed a bit. Right. Yeah. Years ago, I think you used to be able to keep up to five um, uh, steelhead. And, and now it's with a sport, it's two and conservation, it's one. You know, you and I as individuals can't do anything about changing those regulations. And if you want to go out and, you know, what whichever license you have, if you want to keep your one or two fish, you have every right to do that. However, this is such a touchy subject. and I'm not sure the right words to use, but consider just opening your mind to understanding that fish are being over harvested they're losing habitats there's invasive species there's increased pollution there's development and just really think do i need to be killing this fish or not and and why am i killing it right if you're if you're using it to you know all, all of it you're going to keep the, the eggs to source as bait and you're going to feed your family with the fish you have every right to go do that and i'm not going to say that you can't i'm just saying just consider trying to open your mind a little bit to asking yourself do i need to do this yeah and i feel like again i have nothing against keeping trout i keep the odd trout myself but some people and usually they're not serious anglers they will keep their limit every time they go out fishing and the thing is that's totally fine like that's the law that we have now even if we don't agree with it that's what it is you can keep two steelhead every time you go out or one depending on your license and then there's people that are totally against keeping any fish and there has to be some you know leeway between both those because it's not wrong to keep a fish but at the same time you shouldn't be keeping or in my opinion you probably shouldn't be keeping fish every time you go out because like you said there's so many factors involved especially fishing where we fish on the north shore of lake ontario we're in a huge area with hundreds and hundreds of steelhead anglers and you have to think if, if everyone goes out and keeps let's, let's just say five fish a year and there's hundreds and hundreds of steelhead anglers and everyone keeps five fish a year that adds up quick right i always think of uh there's an example it says nothing to a steelhead but there's a lake that i grew up fishing with my dad and they're showing me pictures from you know back in the day they'd have big stringers of five pound largemouth just every time they went out they'd keep their full stringer of, of big bass. They're all like three, four, five, six pounds, even some of them. And there'd be like not just one of them, but like the whole family, like my uncle and grandpa and all that. And they'd be keeping fish. And the, you know, the campers beside them would be keeping the fish too. And now that lake has no fish in it. And they're like, oh, it's too bad about that lake. Like uh, it got fished out. It's like, yeah, it did. And it was you guys that did it. You know, like it has consequences. These fish don't grow back in like, you know, one year you keep these fish. It takes them years to get the size where they're going to spawn. So you have to, like, I like what you said. You have to think about should I kill this fish, or maybe think about should I kill this many fish a year and try to try to keep ethics in there a little bit because it is a, a a resource that's slowly and slowly getting smaller and smaller and more people are fishing. So it is something definitely to think about. And again, we you, we. Yeah, we here in Ontario, simply put, just we just don't have the resources with stocking that we see in some of the states. And, and the, the, the data is there. There's some of the dams and, and that you can collect the, the metrics on and you see, you see the number like it's you can't debate it. The numbers are decreasing. You know, it's one thing if a half million or a million fish were stocked in each system across North, you know, Ontario then I'd say, go, go, whatever your number is, and you're allowed to go do it, go do it, you know, and that's more of that put and take fishery where we don't have that same put and take fishery here in Ontario. So really, I just just trying to ask everyone to open your mind a little bit to, you know, do I really need to kill these fish right now or not? Yeah, it's not like Lake Michigan, where they're literally dumping cohos and 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 salmon just in the lake and they're like listen these are in here for you guys keep them you know they don't have a super high successful spawn rate anyway these guys are going out taking their limits that's what they're there for in ontario they don't they don't do that unfortunately so yeah definitely yeah. keep that in mind so i thought we could talk a little bit about another topic that is very important and not a lot of people talk about it is uh, river etiquette now that is one thing that 
I've had many people over the years tell me it kind of turned them off of steelhead fishing is the lack of etiquette that some people have. And I'm not saying everyone does this. A lot of serious steelhead anglers are very, they're very good, but there are some grouchy ones and a lot of new people, maybe they don't, they don't know they're new or give them the benefit of the doubt. So when it comes to steelhead fishing, we'll just talk about a few of them, but what are some of the things that you should absolutely not do? If you're just new to steelhead fishing and you just don't know, what should you never do? <laughs> right. Yeah, no, that's, this is, it's a great question and I'm glad we could talk about this. Um, before we even get to other anglers, let's let's just take this back and consider um, the resource itself. Be careful, especially during trout opener. Now, most of these fish have spawned. You'll see fish on spawning beds. Um, one, never target fish that have, that are in their spawning um, time. Your are really on their way up or on their way down. There's definitely a, an ethical red flag if you're targeting fish that are in the middle of doing their spawn. Um, as well as watching for um, na now vacant um, reds, their nests that they build. They're very identifiable. You can go on Google and see what does a steelhead um, nest or, or bed look like. And essentially, it's after the fish have done their spawn, they've kicked up rocks and they've created sort of like an oval in the water, which is identifiable as a very lighter toned circle in the water. And that's where fish has made its nest. So just be very mindful of that and not to go step in on hundreds of fish that are hopefully one day going to be real size steelhead that you can catch, yeah. um, which at that point would just be fertilized eggs. And uh, the ethics of uh, taking out everything you bring in, um, any sort of garbage you bring in, Tim Hortons coffee cups, uh, you know, wrappers, you know, bait packaging, whatever it is have the mindset of the right thing to do and the ethical thing to do is pack out more than you even bring in. And that's just a camping thing, a hunting thing, a fishing thing. Anytime you go out, um, just be, be careful of not even realizing, you know, a wrapper might blow out of your pocket or whether you're intentionally doing it or not, do your best to always leave the resource cleaner than it was there than when you showed up. Right. Definitely. And then now the, the beast of other anglers and the ethics <laughs> of, um you know the etiquette of other anglers you know all i can say is we're all humans respect each other um some some clear crystal crystal clear rules if someone's in a spot before you they they got there they got they probably get up earlier to be there you know they're there they're fishing it give them the space even more so after you know the opening day and afterwards once we're talking the end of april and may like i said earlier at the start of this podcast you can go fish anywhere we're not restricted to just uh, south of the CN tracks on 20. You know, go go give your legs a stretch. Go get more steps in. Go find, you know, go for an adventure. Go find somewhere else to fish. But when it's, you know, the opening morning, you know, ethically, if you want a spot, the earlier you get there, be the first one there. If someone's already there, they beat you. They beat you. Like, yeah. they're there. Um, you know, if... You want to fish that spot and it's it's your only spot you know you have to go fish that spot well you should have got up earlier but you know approach that angler first don't go stand right beside them that's what causes so much of of the fighting and, and issues use your words ask do you mind if i fish here i'm going to respect your space i'm going to respect your fishing do you mind if i angle here with you that yeah. can go so far and if somebody says no well, there's your answer. Don't don't make it a thing. This mm -hmm. person wants that space. Like I said, they got there before you. Let them fish. What yeah. are you like? You both are now peaceful. If you just walk away and go fish somewhere else, and do even one better, go down to the bend below him where he can see you or she, and hook up and let them see you catch fish. How is that going to make you feel instead of standing beside someone and have them out fish you in a spot they beat you to? You that's know, a, like that's hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> right so just it's the space thing respect that heart yeah and it happens every year to me i'll be fishing a spot even by myself or with another guy where we're at a, like a bend or something and some guy will high hole us so just go above and just let his float drift right up like right through where we're fishing it's like buddy this is literally where i am and you're just drifting right in front of me like now i'm waiting on you to pull your bobber out you know so it 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 can make even the most peaceful people 
dream of violence. So <laughs> I would recommend, yeah, give people space. And I've had guys that come up to me and be like, hey, it's a nice big hole. It could definitely hold two guys. And they come up to me and they're like, hey, you know, I'm just heading down. Do you mind if I make a few drifts at the tail end? I'm like, no problem. You know, do your thing. You know, and I've also had guys where, you know, I, I have a fish on in a pool and I'm fighting it, you know, below the pool to keep it out of the main pool and I get it in. And they'll just swoop in and start fishing the pool. And I'm like, dude, I was literally fishing there. But then again, I've had other people be like, hey, do you mind if I make a few drifts while you're, you know, taking care of the fish? Like, no problem. As soon as I'm done, you know, they're on their way. So there's definitely, there's being polite and ethical and, and etiquette that you have on the water that can just make everyone happier. And I'm not saying that there's a lot of bad anglers out there because there's not, but a few that might make you want to pull your hair out. But most of them are absolutely fantastic. Like I've never had a problem with Jake when I saw him down the creek. He's never high hold me or anything, but <laughs> I'm sure that you have some pretty, we're not going to talk about them. But I'm sure you've had some pretty interesting experiences over the years. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I think I've probably experienced everything you can. And, you know, I can, I can think I can honestly say I've never said no to somebody who's out if they could fish with in where I was, if there you know, wasn't anybody else there. It goes so far if you use your words and say, do you mind if I throw some drifts in here with you? Yeah. For someone to say no, they got to be a pretty, you know, unpleasant person. Yeah. And then why even be in that situation in the first, then, you know, in that, in that instance, go somewhere else, go find somewhere else. These fish are everywhere. And I can honestly tell you, I've caught so many fish in areas that people just walk over before going to major pools and, and major runs. I said earlier in the pod, the fish have to go through every part of the water system to get to those spots, upwards and downwards. Yeah. And the amount of fish that are in transition in those areas, you can go pick fish off all over the place. Definitely. Because so, a, lot, a lot of the times the fish get pressured, right? And they'll, they'll drop back below the pool. Maybe there'll be one behind a rock or a boulder, some spot you wouldn't even think twice about. You walk right by it. But if you if you see all the anglers fishing the pools and you kind of work backwards behind the pool or above it, sometimes you're fishing a pool and and the fish get spooked and you'll just see them shoot down river, right? Those fish go somewhere. You you can find them. Usually they're going to be at the next slightly deep spot. Go look and find those fish. And generally they're they're not as pressured and you can catch them. So that's fantastic. That's also another tip too. So if you see Jake down at the river and you want to watch what he's doing and learn a little bit. You go up and ask him if you can fish the pool with him. He just told you that literally he said, yes, you can 100% go up to him. And maybe he'll even give you some row bags too. <laughs> I was going to say too, another thing that I try to do, I've done this a few times, uh, still fishing, but other fishing too. If you see someone that is clearly a beginner, clearly, you have to think how intimidating this is for them. It's intimidating for a lot of people to go steal fishing, but as a total beginner, they may not, you know, they may have done their research and stuff, but maybe they don't know what bait to use. Maybe they don't know where to put their split shots. Like I've had people ask me, that, how do I do it? Do I bunch them up? Do I drift them out? You know, like they don't know. Spend two seconds and, and help these guys and girls out. Give them, a, give them a bunch of row bags. Give them a pack of pink worms. Give them some hooks, like whatever they need. Just be like, yeah, this is what we're doing. Here, you should be fishing around here. This is a good spot. Just try here. You know, oh, your bobber looks a bit low. Maybe, you know, put it up a little bit. Give them some tips. These are the anglers of the future. And these people, they're going to help other people too, eventually when they learn good. So keep it going, have the, you know, the good karma, so to say, like help a, help a brother out. And, you know, it just, it makes it a more pleasurable experience for everyone. So that's one thing that I'd recommend. If you see Jake, maybe he'll have some, you know, gifts that he can give you, but don't quote me on that. <laughs> but speaking of gifts, we actually have an awesome giveaway. And I said to Jake that, oh, we'll mention it halfway, but we got talking and I totally forgot. Love talking about fishing, right? <laughs> so why don't you tell us a bit about our, our giveaway of this episode, Jake? Yeah, so what we want to do is um, sort of outfit um, the lucky winner here with some some product here that would sort of give you that array of everything we talked about, um, what you should be bringing with you for tread open and different things to have. So um, like you said, you can have uh, a ton of stuff with you that takes time to accumulate and you, or you can just go out with some, some of the core, core things. So, um, what we're going to do is give away a hundred dollar credit to the shop and, um, that will definitely get somebody going with a bunch of row, spawn time, leader, shot hooks, anything you would need to get yourself on the water, or you can put it towards a new rod or a new reel or whatever it is. But 
um, yeah, we like to offer up a hundred bucks to the store that uh, somebody can win to get some get some gear. That's absolutely awesome. I I'm not allowed to enter, but I I really want to make a fake account right now and enter. But yeah, so <laughs> as always, everyone always asks, how can you enter? Well, you got to be a Patreon member. The group of awesome guys and girls every month who donate a few bucks to keep this show running, so that me and Andrew don't pay for it out of our own pockets. We would like to thank Jake too for offering such an awesome giveaway. I said he could do a five bucks, but he said a hundred. So, you know, that's great. And honestly, a hundred bucks. If I was looking through your website right now, I could buy a lot of stuff for a hundred bucks. So I'd just like to add one thing. If you do purchase something from Fish Ads Canada, just write in the comments when you order that Average Ontario Angler sent you. That way, Jake knows how awesome it is to be a sponsor on our show and maybe he'll do it again. So do us that favor. Thanks again. That's an awesome giveaway. You could buy, like you said, you could buy almost everything you need to get ready. Or if you're already into steel fishing, you got all that stuff, put it towards a new rod. Buy some fluorocarbon. That stuff ain't cheap. Like you can you can use this as a great giveaway. So I'd like to thank you for that. Awesome to have Jake on the podcast. It's very seasonal, this podcast. Like it's unfortunate. I get a lot of people be like, Can we have another steelhead podcast? Can we do this? But hey, we have to go through the month. We got to do what's popular this month. Next week, we're going to be talking about other things like crappie and, and walleye coming up. And then it's musky, then it's bass, then it's, you know, it just keeps going. But I'm glad that we had a lot of awesome steelhead guys. We had angling art a few weeks ago. And I've been trying to get Jake on the podcast for a while. So it's absolutely awesome to have him. We, I learned a lot today. And I know that someone that's just getting into steelhead fishing or even an intermediate steelhead angler definitely learned a lot too. So we do appreciate that. So before we end this episode, I warned Jake, though, because I'm a nice guy. I'm like Andrew, who just throws people onto the sword. But we have the quote of the week. So what's the quote of the week? Okay, short and simple. Um, we've used these words already. These are things I replay in my head from fishing, and it's not happening. Very short, very simple. Persistence and patience. <laughs>